All right, everybody, this is Ross. Uh, in today's video, we are gonna touch on two topics. First off, we're gonna talk about rooting fig trees. We're gonna do a very quick and easy and simple demonstration here on rooting fig cuttings. And uh, the reason why we're rooting these is actually for rootstock. So what I really wanna talk about in this video is actually rootstocks of figs and why I think growing figs as rootstocks and also grafting figs is so important. Now, these are some cuttings here actually that I have uh, pruned off my trees in the, in the fall. It's now actually almost the spring. And I actually left these cuttings here um, on the ground and let them sit there all winter time. And I'm looking at them now and they really do seem quite viable. So I didn't want to let them go to waste. I also have this whole space nowadays that is uh, really great for propagating. I have all my seeds set up over here. I've got some melons and different things going on in the greenhouse. Check out our other videos if you're interested. But I also have enough room in here to do some propagating of fig cuttings. And uh, I figure why let these cuttings go to waste? Plus, I do see a huge benefit of using rootstock for figs. Now, these are varieties that are unknown to me. I'm not entirely sure what these are. I can make a guess as to maybe a handful of varieties that they might be, uh, be from, but I can guarantee you that these are some vigorous varieties. These are cuttings taken from vigorous trees. And that's really important because when you're selecting rootstock, first off, you want a very vigorous cutting to start, I think. You want something that's very healthy with good node spacing, something that is definitely from a vigorous variety. Now, there's two schools of thought, and that one school of thought, and a lot of people maybe in Europe, would rather actually have a more dwarf fig tree. And I don't necessarily agree with that. I don't think there's much benefit, maybe for the homeowner, that uh, you know wants to have a smaller fig tree, let's say in their garden or maybe in their front yard or something, that might be nice. But in all honesty, I don't see really much value in that either, simply because the more vigorous this variety is, the more potential for more figs. It doesn't always correlate well, right? If it's too vigorous, sometimes there's too many leaves and therefore it actually uh, gets it sh itself shaded out and there's not enough light penetration in the tree uh, and dwarf varieties most often actually get the right level of light penetration but if you can control your tree and if you're more of a pro at this you can certainly maximize the amount of fruit off of a more vigorous variety so I'm particularly a bigger proponent of the more vigorous varieties now I do have a dwarf tree over there in the ground that's specifically for experimental purposes to see if having a dwarfing rootstock really is going to you know get me some sort of more positive benefit and i've trialed now over the years probably with somewhere around 50 to maybe even 80 different varieties of rootstock now i haven't given them uh, all of them such a great fair shot but certainly I've noticed that over the years, the trees that are of a more vigorous variety, that are grafted onto a more vigorous variety, certainly perform a lot better, behave a lot better, they're easier to deal with, uh, and you get more fruit out of them. Now, I also believe that if we're gonna really be scientific or really going to be serious, let's say, I don't know if scientific's really the right word, but if we're gonna be super serious as a hobbyist of growing figs, we need to really pay attention to the traits of these varieties. Because a lot of us out there, maybe a lot of you guys watching are, are trying to figure out really what is the best variety of fig for your particular climate. And that's a really challenging uh, you know, topic to tackle. It really is. I mean, there's a lot of variables. Figs change so much from year to year. You really have to wait a number of years for the trees to even mature. Uh, one year the tree could be doing something and the next year it could be doing something totally opposite. So it's quite difficult. And I, um, I think to really make this easier and to make this whole process more accurate, I truly believe that all the varieties that you grow should be grafted 
onto the same rootstock, onto let's say brown turkey, right, is another, is a great example of a rootstock that is very vigorous, probably would give you a lot more production on your trees. And therefore, I think if you had that standardized across all of the varieties, it would make differentiating between certain characteristics a lot easier and a lot more accurate. You know, you could certainly argue that one variety is more productive than the other, but is it really? Is it in fact actually because maybe the vigor isn't as vigorous on the one and the vigor is more appropriate on the other? So there's really a lot of questions that go into this. As you know, a lot of us probably know at this point, the fruit forms on that new growth. So if the new growth, the main crop, is vigorous and healthy and actually aids in allowing the tree to fruit, maybe getting enough light penetration into the tree, uh, we're going to have more success. So that's a really key point right there. Another key point I want to make is, well, I think there's also some great benefits in terms of rootstock for different resistances to things. Uh, certainly LSU Purple is one that has been noted by LSU uh, in their breeding program to actually have really good resistances to root knot nematodes. Um, there's also some varieties that really resist a lot of the fig mosaic virus that's present in a lot of these different varieties. So some varieties, let's say, should absolutely be grafted. Maybe you can make an argument that some other varieties don't necessarily need it, but certain varieties like Aishia Black from UC Davis, Ative de Argentile, even some of the like the Grise de Saint Jean varieties, maybe even Pastelier, some of the more dwarf, more difficult to establish varieties would greatly benefit by being grafted. So I would certainly argue, um, you know, for at least, at the very least, if you're still on the fence of this, is at least graft, you know, those certain uh, varieties I've mentioned. Now, some of the varieties that are very vigorous, you could think of are raspberry latte, brown turkey, um, any of the Palmata hybrids with Ficus carica, Black Beauty 10. Usually Black Mission's pretty uh, vigorous. Um, man, there's actually quite a few, and I think maybe down in my description of this video, I have a spreadsheet, and I should have a list there of very vigorous varieties that I grow. Um, certainly Black Beauty 10. Smith is a good one. Texas BA1 is another good one. Long de Dute's a good one. Uh, in terms of the dwarf varieties, some of the ones I've only really found are Little Ruby. And also there might be a strain, a select uh, source, I should say, of Pastelier that is actually dwarf as well. So, but for the most part, um, those are really what your, your options are. It's trying to find something either probably either on the lower vigor side or on the higher vigor side. Again, I don't know what these are, uh, but I can tell you that they're definitely quite vigorous. So I've actually got a bin back here that I've already started rooting. This is actually Texas BA1. And I decided that uh, we're gonna take some cuttings off of this tree. It survived the winter. We're not gonna go any lower this winter. So I took some cuttings off um, and just stuck them in soil. Took long branches, probably at least 12 foot, you know, the longer you can go, the uh, more success you're going to have, obviously. Um, I truly believe that with longer cuttings, it gives you obviously more surface area to actually have below the soil, but then more uh, nodes above the soil to eventually uh, potentially leaf out and form a, a stronger, more vigorous tree more quickly. So again, these varieties here are going to be for rootstock. I may actually grow some of the Texas BA1 for fruit. I may sell some of the Texas BA1, but at the end of the day, it's actually a really great rootstock. So I know what those are, but what I'm gonna do very simply is because this is kind of a new environment of rooting, I've never rooted here in the greenhouse. I've done some outdoor rooting in the ground. I've done some outdoor rooting in pots. Um, I figured all that out really well. I've also done indoor rooting for many years now in a grow closet with very low humidity and very uh, specified temperatures and it's a very stable environment. This greenhouse is not very stable and I have a space heater here on my left. Also, it's gonna warm up quite drastically during the day and cool off 
pretty significantly at night. So we have some issues in this environment. And worst case scenario, I root these cuttings, they don't take, I lose nothing. This is sort of an experiment in a sense to even see if this is a, an adequate rooting environment. As I've said many times, if you're gonna be new to rooting figs is that you should get yourself some cheap cuttings that don't matter to you, root them first and see how you do. Check out your environment, check out your lights, check out your soil, the moisture in the soil, um, your different techniques, hone that in and then go for the crazy expensive stuff. So that's what I'm doing here is that I'm literally practicing what I preach. So what I'm gonna do, I've actually cut these into the desired length. I've pruned off the ends because the ends were drying out a little bit. They've been outside for like, you know, four months or so just lying on the ground. Um, we're also gonna do a nice little score on the bottom. I'm using pruning shears here. We're gonna expose the cambium, expose the hardwood, and then we're just gonna stick this all the way down at the bottom of our pot. And that's it. Cover up the, uh, the cutting a little bit with the soil. And that's it. I'm not even going to cover this with parafilm. These cuttings are so thick. The environment I'm currently in right now has a 60% humidity. And unfortunately, the humidity level is going to fluctuate a little too much than I want. And that's going to make this difficult. Rooting these figs actually quite difficult until the roots can really get established which is nice so that I have a lot of buds to work with because if one bud fails, at least I have other buds along these cuttings to ensure that I have some decent success. This is a weird cutting. I don't know why I cut it like that. And I'm, I'm just making one score. This is gonna help me callous where I made the score. And that callousing process is extremely important for this, this whole process. It really speeds up the rooting process. Rather than having them have to root from the bottom of the cutting or along the nodes, we now have this option to root from where I scored the bark. I don't like to take off any nodes, but I'll do it around nodes. Um, usually one or two nodes up from the bottom, I will score the, the bark. And we're just sticking them all the way in here. I'm really doing this as like, the easiest way I know possible. This is the direct potting method, the same method we use indoors. And we've been using this method for years. And what I could do is wait till the spring and just stick these right in the ground. I could create myself a propagation bed. It really wouldn't be all that difficult. I think I went a little bit too deep with the score on that one, but we'll see what happens, all right? Don't experiment. If I get something out of this, that's awesome. Now, some of you might be thinking, how long is it gonna take you, Ross, for you to get rootstock? By the way, there was a little bit of extra wood on the bottom of this cutting below a node. I cut it as close as I can get to that node. Then I turn the node over behind it, make my score. But yeah, some of you might be asking, well, Ross, when can I graft onto this wood that you're rooting right now? Well, some people I've seen actually do some rooting um, right here. They'll do the rooting and the grafting in one shot. I think if you're gonna do that, you gotta be an expert upon experts of like, you gotta have the greenest thumb on the planet. I can't do that. I don't recommend you do it. I don't know anyone that's ever really been able to do it successfully, consistently. Um, the best case scenario here that we're gonna have is that these root out right now, we've given them an early start to the season. Our spring doesn't begin for another two months or average last frost is two months away. So then I'm going to essentially give them a head start to the season. They're gonna grow all year. I'm gonna make sure I water them as much as I need to. And then about at the end of the season, they should harden off well. Um, they should lignify well. And then about this time, or let's say actually May, early May, I will do my grafting after bud break when these trees are awake. So this is a two year process. This isn't something that happens overnight. We can't just magically create rootstock. And I think 
a lot of people who want rootstock end up having to pay, you know, quite a bit of money to get some rootstock. Or let's say they have extra trees lying around. Um, this I think is a really great way for people to get themselves uh, some rootstock here. Is just take off, you know, vigorous branches off of your trees. Um, and unfortunately, like I said, it just takes some time. You got to be patient with this. It's not going to happen overnight for you. Um, like any good rootstock, let's say it's a persimmon, you know, it's uh, something you planted from seed, like an apple seed or, you know, uh, stone fruits, pears, whatever it is. This takes some time. You don't want to rush this. You want to get an established rootstock here so that when you actually do your grafting, the rootstock is established enough to actually take the graft and grow from that graft. Otherwise, you're going to waste scion. So, you know, I will keep you guys updated on this process as we go. Um, of course, we're going to get a glimpse of what these trees look like throughout the wintertime. But I'll keep you guys updated maybe at the end of the year. We'll talk about how they did, if they're going to succeed in this environment. And then we'll talk about, once again, the following year in the spring when I actually do my grafting. Believe it or not, this year I actually have roughly 25 to 30 rootstocks that I can graft onto this year. So I'm really looking forward to that. We'll do some videos on grafting. Again, I'll keep you guys updated and... Uh, We'll see everybody soon, all right? Hit that subscribe button. You got this far. Appreciate you guys watching, all right? Take care.